The planet Venus is one of the most hostile places in our solar system. But what if I was to tell you that within its history, it could have potentially been an oasis much like that of Earth? In this video, we will be talking about the evidence that points towards ancient oceans on Venus and what might have happened to those oceans. So let's talk about that. Hello to all you space enthusiasts, and if you are new to this channel, then welcome to Martian Wolf. I hope you learned something from this video or some of the others that I've created in the past. Nonetheless, today we're going to be talking about ancient oceans on Venus and whether or not they truly ever existed. But what does all this mean and why is it important? Let's begin with that why question. Why would we want to know about ancient oceans on Venus? One of the critical components to this question can relate to the search for life off of Earth, which is one of NASA's major goals as well as a wider goal in space exploration. Now the search for life off of Earth correlates to the search for water, because as life as we know it here on Earth requires water in many forms. Therefore, by looking at different locations in our solar system that either currently has water or in the past has held water, can point towards evidence where maybe a world was once habitable or there could even currently be life there. Now, nonetheless, we might not be expecting to find true organisms existing on Venus in the near future. However, we can address whether or not these planets once had vast amounts of water, because if they were habitable for long periods of time, then just maybe life was able to form there. Now, another critical component as to why we might want to understand if ancient oceans existed on Venus is because, as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, it's relatively difficult to live on Venus now. In fact, it's hard to even send robotic missions because of the incredibly high temperatures and pressures on the surface. Therefore, if we can understand what happened to Venus, if it did have oceans and became the very hot and hostile world it is today, and we can use this information to learn more about atmospheric science as well as the complex nature of Venus's atmosphere, to not only understand how exactly Venus has evolved throughout time, but also what we can learn more about Earth. So now we need to address how we know ancient oceans may have existed on Venus. Because if you look at the planet today, it's incredibly dry with only very minimal amounts of water vapor in the atmosphere. Therefore, there isn't a lot of evidence that point towards oceans even existing on the surface. In fact, Venus can be seen as the opposite of an oasis. So how do we know that oceans may have existed in the past? To understand this, we need to take a trip back in time. In 1978, NASA launched the Pioneer Venus Project, which included two separate spacecraft, one of which was an orbiter which would try and study Venus from orbit around the planet, and secondly, a multiprobe, which would send five spacecraft into Venus's atmosphere to try and understand more about the composition of the atmosphere as well as how it changes at different altitudes above the surface. Now, as the multiprobe was entering the atmosphere or the different components were, it was relaying the data back to the orbiter, which then came back to Earth. And as NASA was looking over this data, they found some very interesting numbers. One specifically that we'll be talking about today is a D to H ratio. It turns out that the D to H ratio at Venus is 120 times that of the D to H ratio here on Earth. But I know what you might be thinking, what is a D to H ratio? And a D to H ratio is essentially a ratio of deuterium to hydrogen. But again, you might be thinking, okay, I've heard of hydrogen before, but what is deuterium? And why is there a ratio between the two? Deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen. So what does that mean? Well, normal hydrogen has one proton in its nucleus, whereas deuterium has one proton and one neutron. Now, since deuterium has this extra neutron, it's going to be heavier than a normal proton atom. In fact, it'll be roughly twice as heavy. But since deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen, it is very similar in how it acts as a chemical, meaning that instead of having a normal hydrogen atom somewhere, in a lot of cases, you can replace it for a deuterium atom because the neutron doesn't affect how exactly the element is charged. Therefore, what this ends up meaning 
is that in some cases you can replace hydrogen in a molecule. The best example would be water. Every water molecule has two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, as it's called H2O. However, in some cases, instead of having a hydrogen atom for one of the hydrogens, it would be deuterium, which makes the water a little bit heavier, and this is given the name heavy water. So ultimately, you can drink heavy water, at least in small quantities, and statistically speaking, you probably have at least one gram of heavy water in your body right now. Because the D to H ratio, or the deuterium to hydrogen ratio here on Earth, is roughly one out of every 6,400. Meaning out of every 6,400 hydrogen atoms, there's one deuterium atom. And this is what is very different on Venus. On Venus, it's for every 62 hydrogen atoms, there is one deuterium atom. But what does this isotope ratio have to do with ancient oceans on Venus? But I'll counter you with a different question. What makes comets so pretty. Now, comets have these amazing tails that last for nearly a million kilometers, and these tails are formed from dust and ice interacting with the solar wind as they get closer and closer to the sun. Now, a critical difference between a comet and maybe a planet is the fact that most planets orbit around the sun in a fairly circular-like orbit, meaning that really no matter where they are or what time of year it is, they're going to be about the same distance from the star, or from our sun. However, comets are quite different. Instead, they orbit in a very elliptical manner, such that they spend a vast period of time very far away from the sun. So as they're far from the sun, they can accumulate dust and be very cold, forming ice. However, when they spend a very short period of time getting closer and closer to the sun, the hotter temperatures and the higher intensity in the solar wind will cause the dust and ice to blow apart, essentially making beautiful comets or these massive tails that we can see. From the comets that we have been able to explore as humans, we have noticed that the D to H ratio is roughly twice that of what we have here on Earth. And when we look at the D to H ratio of asteroids or some planetesimals, it's actually closer to what we have here on Earth. Now, some of you watching this video might be a little confused. The title and the introduction was talking about Venus and oceans that may have existed. Then we started talking about an isotope of hydrogen. And then after that, I just started talking about comets and asteroids. What do all these have to do with each other? And some of you might have figured it out by this point. But there's one more thing that I need to say. And this is the fact that terrestrial planets, so those like the Earth, Mars, Venus, and Mercury are too small and too hot in order to maintain hydrogen in their atmospheres. Now let me say this one more time, they're too small and too hot to maintain vast quantities of hydrogen in their atmosphere. The element itself is just too light such that if it reaches the temperature of the planet, it'll just escape into space. And it's also the same for helium. This is one of the reasons why it's said that we have a helium shortage, is because after we extract it from the ground, it essentially goes up into the atmosphere and eventually just leaves our planet entirely. Now this is a major difference between the terrestrial planets and the gas giants. The gas giants are primarily made up of gas, hence their name, which is a lot of hydrogen and some helium. And Jupiter and Saturn, which are these massive planets, have a strong enough gravity and are cool enough in order to maintain vast quantities of hydrogen in their atmosphere. So that's one of the main differences, is that Earth and Venus and Mars, they just can't hold hydrogen. Meaning that, if they have hydrogen in the form of water, they must have gotten it from somewhere. They must have gotten it from comets, or asteroids, or planetesimals. Things that came from further out in the solar system and impacted with these rocky bodies, ultimately leaving them with water. So I hope the picture is becoming a little bit more clearer. Earth, Mars, and Venus, in order to have massive oceans at any point in their history, needed to be bombarded with comets or asteroids that brought the hydrogen from the outer parts of the solar system. Now, it's important to note that Earth currently has these massive oceans, which still exist today. 
Mars has vast quantities of water either under the surface or in the form of ice on the ice caps. Whereas Venus is just incredibly dry, and as we know it right now only has minimal amounts of water in its atmosphere. Therefore, there are some critical differences. If objects are truly random or dispersed in our solar system, then we would expect the D to H ratio to be similar. Now, I should note that Mars's value is roughly five times that of Earth's. So it's not the exact same, but it's within an order of magnitude. However, Venus's is again, 120 times the value. So first of all, this is a very strange ratio, but is it completely out of the realm of science or is it something that we can actually predict or estimate could happen throughout time? And there is a way that a D to H ratio could be this massive at least assuming that it started out very Earth-like. Now I should mention that Earth and Venus are very similar in size, mass, and composition. So it's not too far of an assumption to say that maybe in the distant past, they were much more similar to one another, not only in size, mass, and composition, but also in their environment as a whole. So how could the D to H ratio get so large, or how could it become what it is today? And a critical component has to relate to the two topics I talked about earlier. First of all, remember that deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen. And the fact is that it's roughly twice as heavy as a normal hydrogen atom. The second thing that I want you to remember is the fact that Earth, Venus, Mars, or all these terrestrial planets are just too light or not large enough to maintain vast quantities of hydrogen in their atmosphere. Therefore, some scientists predict that it's possible that a D to H ratio this high could have occurred if only hydrogen was able to leave the atmosphere, but not deuterium, because it's just slightly heavier. Therefore, over millions or billions of years, hydrogen would gradually leave Venus's atmosphere, leaving behind the heavier element, being deuterium. Now, given this information, eventually over time, the deuterium to hydrogen ratio would increase and increase and increase until it gets to the value that it is today, being 120 times what we see here on Earth. So that's just one explanation, and there might be others as well. But given that explanation, does that mean that Venus once had massive oceans? Because we know how much there is today, so can we back propagate and look at what it might have looked like a billion or a few billion years ago? Well, that's where the predictions can start to vary quite drastically. Because again, it's based off the assumptions that are made in the models. Some assumptions are very optimistic in that it's thought that Venus could have once had a similar size ocean to that here on Earth. And that that ocean could have existed for billions of years, upwards of 800 million years ago. And the reason why that could be groundbreaking is because on Mars, it's thought that it too could have once had oceans However, it's estimated that they would have only existed for a few hundred million years. So if it is the case that Venus had oceans for billions of years, that's almost an order of magnitude greater the amount of time that it could have oceans, meaning that much longer period of time for life to potentially form. However, on the other end of the spectrum in terms of predictions on Venus's pasts, some models predict that it's almost always been the way that it is today meaning that since it's so close to the sun and if its atmosphere has always been too large, then most of the water would have only existed in the atmosphere as water vapor. And therefore, it would have been very difficult for large oceans to form. Maybe for short periods of time, little amounts of water on the surface. However, for the most part, it was always a hostile planet. So it's very difficult to say what exactly Venus used to look like. So the best way to learn more about Venus and whether or not it once had oceans is to send missions there. In fact, over the course of the last month, both NASA and the European Space Agency have selected missions to go to Venus by the late 2020s and early 2030s. These missions including Da Vinci Plus, Veritas, and InVision. Now Da Vinci Plus is through NASA, which is a probe that will enter the atmosphere of Venus and record the D to H ratio at multiple altitudes to verify the past observations. InVision, which is through the European Space Agency, will measure the D to H ratio from orbit and try and trace the terrain to understand more about the ground. And lastly, Veritas, which is through NASA, 
will map the terrain and search for continents to see whether or not there are other methods to see if oceans truly existed on Venus. The Missing Oceans of Venus Venus being Earth's twin sister can have a wide range of histories. One that is an oasis that existed for billions of years, or maybe it's always been as hostile as it is today. We really don't know yet. Now with that being said, we shouldn't give up on our search. There is so much more that we can learn about Venus's history. Much like trying to predict the far future, the distant past is almost as much of an unknown and depends on our current observations and our fundamental understanding of science. Therefore, by sending more missions to Venus or throughout our solar system, we can not only improve our understanding of what is going on at these different worlds, but also improve our understanding of science. So with all that being said, I hope you learned something new about the planet Venus, whether it be comets, asteroids, deuterium, or even the new missions that are going over the next decade. But if you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. And if you wanna learn more about space exploration, up and coming missions, or the future of humanity in space, please consider subscribing to this channel. But thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.